this morning we're returning to the subject of power electronics but what we're going to be looking at are the losses when you try to switch a, uh, a MOSFET in this case it's a power MOSFET it's the same one that we've been using all along it's not an especially powerful MOSFET in fact it's been around for a long time uh, and it's relatively low power as power MOSFETs go. So what you see on the screen, disregard for the moment this very lowest trace. The, this trace in the light green is the uh, output from the generator and I'm driving it at about 4 volts No, I'm sorry, 5 volts. So what I'm going to do is reduce that down to... ...3 volts. And the reason that I want to reduce it down to 3 volts is, you may notice now that the... Uh, the, the next signal, which is the actual gate of the MOSFET, seems to rise like a normal, let me run this out a little, like a normal RC circuit. In other words, this is charging the gate. It comes up here. And you may notice that as the gate charges, the drain voltage, which is this next trace in, in purple, begins to fall and the current through the MOSFET begins to rise. But now we'll go to the bottom trace and you notice on the bottom trace uh, this is a math trace. What it is is the product of this voltage on the drain and this current through the MOSFET. So in other words, it's the power dissipated in the transistor, in the MOSFET. Notice that at the time when the MOSFET turns off, which is this time, the drain voltage rises, the, the drain current doesn't drop instantaneously and as a result there's a peak of uh, power. This of course heats up the transistor a little bit but then there's a period of time and then when it turns on there also is a time when there is uh, a fair amount of current and a still a fair amount of voltage on the drain and so you see another little hump in the uh, uh, power down here. So you think well maybe one thing we need to do is drive the gate a little harder because the faster we turn this this junction or this uh, channel on the less time overlap so let's first go to 4 volts and you notice that when we get to 4 volts that something starts to happen to this uh, gate voltage Instead of the, the continuous rise as we had, it seems to plateau here. And that plateau actually has a name. It's called the Miller Plateau, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But notice that we, we actually increased the turn-off time, or, or the turn-off power. And we helped the turn-on power a little bit. So let's suppose we went to 5 volts drive. Now you notice we have very little turn on power, but notice we've done nothing about the turn off and the reason for that is that we're having to discharge this, uh, the gate, through the same resistance that we are using to charge it. and. Because of that, and because of the peculiarities of the generator that we're using, it has, has a fairly high output impedance, there is still a significant amount of uh, power being absorbed. 
And notice also up here, let me expand that, and now let's go back down to 3 volts. And you see, this power gets better. Uh, I'm sorry, it gets worse. But our charge is more like a, a regular RC time constant. So what's going on here when we try to, to drive a little more voltage? Well, what's happening is the Miller effect. Well, we talked about this when we uh, in an earlier video. What's happening is that the capacitance that uh, you're trying to charge on the gate that you're uh, trying to raise to the turn-on level is affected not just by the uh, capacitance between the gate and the uh, source but also by the voltage on the drain and the capacitance between the gate and the drain. So let's take a look at the circuit and we'll talk just a little bit more about why the gate voltage rises and then sort of plateaus for a while and then rises again to its final value. Here is the circuit that we are uh, operating at the present time. Uh, this resistor, I think, let me take a quick look and make sure I still have... Yeah, this, this uh, drain resistor is 100 ohms and the uh, gate resistor is 250 ohms. Now you might ask, why did I choose 250 ohms? And the reason is to, to give a charging current that is comparable to what a microprocessor, uh, a, a, uh, a small uh, unit like an Arduino can supply. And a good design figure for Arduinos is to use between 200 and 300 ohms of limiting resistance to avoid overloading the output pin of an Arduino. And why did I pick an Arduino? Just because it's popular, it gives me something to refer to that is uh, a real world example. If you have uh, more uh, drive, that an Arduino can put out, either because you're using a more robust circuit or because you have inserted a gate drive uh, chip in the middle, which by the way that's why these why they make those gate drive chips, is to interface devices like Arduinos that don't have a lot of, of output current to the high uh, capacitance that you have to drive in a power MOSFET. So the reason that it's hard to drive a power MOSFET isn't, isn't the resistance of the gate, it's the capacitance. So let's take a look at that. Here is the same circuit but redrawn to show the capacitance from gate to drain, the capacitance from gate to source, and the capacitance from drain to source. So the, uh, the driving signal is, is trying to drive through this resistor. And by the way, if you leave this resistor out, not only will you possibly overload the driving circuit, but you'll also create a lot of ringing in the system. I won't talk about that here, but uh, we may see that in a future video. But the main problem is when you're trying to charge up this gate, remember it's sitting at zero volts and all of a sudden you apply a voltage here and you're trying to get this up above its threshold voltage. Well to get there you have to charge this capacitor and you also have to charge this capacitor. Well this one is relatively fixed because the uh, source is tied to ground so this capacitor remains pretty much whatever it is. It can be pretty high. But that's not true of this capacitor. This capacitor is tied to the drain and 
when you try to charge this capacitor, as soon as you reach the, a, the threshold voltage or you reach a voltage where the channel begins to turn on, this drain voltage begins to drop, begins to, to move toward ground. And it's, it's like the capacitor is sort of running away from you. The harder you push on this side of the capacitor, the more the other side, because of the, the drain voltage falling, runs away from you. So I earlier used an analogy of uh, if you're trying to press on something with, that has a spring, but the device starts sliding away from you, until you push it all the way up against a stop, the harder you push on the spring, the faster the thing moves away from you. So uh, it's, it's not like chasing your tail. It's more like the most of the force that you apply to the spring winds up moving the device away from you instead of compressing the spring. Well, if that analogy helps, it, it uh, has helped some people in the past, including me. It's a good mechanical explanation of what's going on. But electrically what is happening is the drain voltage is falling actually faster than you're charging the, than you're pushing on uh, trying to raise the voltage on this side of the capacitor. Why is it falling faster? Because this stage has gain. If this stage had no gain, or if this point were tied to a firm voltage, then charging this capacitor would be the same as charging this one. But because the, it's tied to the, to the drain, and understand what I say tied to, this is inside the uh, MOSFET. You have no control over this. Uh, it's just there as part of the manufacturing process. And as you try to charge it, the drain is going to be running away from you. And that is what is called the Miller effect. And it has the, uh, the effect of multiplying the effective capacitance from gate to drain by the gain of the stage. So if the stage has a gain of 10, for example, that means that this capacitor, when you try to charge it, is as though it were 10 times the size of the actual capacity. And that is why when they specify MOSFET uh, capacitance, they generally do it more in terms of effective charge. In other words, how many coulombs of electricity do you have to put on the gate? In this case, we're talking more like micro or nano coulombs, but nonetheless, a significant amount relative to the impedances of the circuit. And only when you have achieved that level of charge, which involves charging up this capacitor and this one, does this transistor fully turn on. And why is that a problem? Because while this transistor is in the linear region between all the way off and all the way on, or later when you try to turn this off and you're trying to discharge the gate through that resistor, the transistor is uh, moving from the fully on state to the off state, in both of those cases it goes through the linear region and the longer it stays in the linear region, the more the loss, the more the power that is dissipated just in the transistor. Obviously all of the power lost in the, in the MOSFET is uh, unavailable for use at the output. So if we go back to the picture that we used earlier of a power converter, we find that when we're trying to convert power in one form to power in another form, either going from AC to DC, for example, or going from one voltage to another voltage. It's the losses that cause the output power to be less than the input power. And one of the sources of power loss in a power converter circuit is the 
switching losses in the MOSFET itself. So I hope this helps. If you haven't seen this before, I hope it explains it well enough for you to get it. If you haven't seen it for a while, I hope it refreshes your recollection of what the Miller effect is and why gate charge is such an important parameter in a power MOSFET. At any rate, I hope you've learned something. At any rate, uh, maybe just been entertained. But in either case, I hope you stay safe and have a nice day.